Good afternoon, guys. I think I'm the last thing between you guys and drinks, so we better make this entertaining. Um, speaking of taking risks, I think I'm going to get a little risky on the topics here. Um, I'm going to give you sort of a six-month, 12-month, 24-month roadmap of what's happening with wearables and the whole quantified self area. But then I think we're going to go a little bit further than that. It's going to get a little bit trippy and abstract, but I hope that you'll find this to be pretty interesting. Um, quick intro, uh, I'm with Mayfield Fund. We're one of the older venture capital funds in Silicon Valley. Um, have done over 400 deals in over 46 years and 100 IPOs, 175 M&A, uh, that sort of thing. But um, prior to Mayfield, I was at Norwest Venture Partners where I helped build out their consumer mobile practice and um, probably known a little bit more for investing in the games area early on. I grew up a little bit of a geek programming and playing games and then uh, around 2008, 2009, started investing in the games area with companies like Playdom and NG Moco, which were some of the early exits in the gaming space. But then that took my interest into using game design principles for non-gaming applications or so-called gamification of real life. Um, a really good application for that is actually the whole health and wellness area. And so I kind of got into the quantified self space many years ago uh, before it was kind of a thing and had started dabbling in companies in that area. Companies like Lumosity, which are games, but for mental fitness and brain training, they've become a juggernaut now with more than a million paying subscribers. Um, a company called Basis, which I helped to co-found, it was one of the very first wearable companies before wearables was a term. And uh, they had a patent from DARPA, originally used to track soldiers in the field. They would track your heart rate 24 by 7, your skin perspiration levels, which theoretically measured your stress, your ambient skin temperature, motion, all those sorts of things. And uh, we recently sold them to uh, Intel. Um, so I've really been thinking a lot about where all this is going, and I kind of think about this as humanity 2.0, or really where the self-development industry is evolving towards, and rather than quantified self, the notion of an overall quantified life, okay? So my personal story is I grew up playing games and thinking about sort of gamification. I remember plowing hundreds of hours into role-playing games where you're micromanaging your, your alter ego. You're thinking about how much strength do I want? What skills do I want? And then it dawned on me, how come you don't manage your real life this way? And so that kind of triggered the notion of gamification. What if you manage track, plan your real life like you would a character in a game with feedback, statistics, all those sorts of things. That has actually led to investments in companies like Gigia, Badgeville that now provide gamification tools and services for enterprises who want to gamify the experience of their customers, their internal employees, their business partners, all those sorts of things. Um, Later on, I kind of got into uh, the sort of the body hacking movement. And if you've never heard of that, it's a bunch of really geeky people trying very strange things on our bodies and trying to out-geek each other. But uh, effectively, that's sort of the birth of the quantified self-wave, where we're measuring all sorts of things, ingesting things, wearing things, trying to study the data, and figure out how to change and modify our own behaviors for optimal outcomes. So Quantified Self 1.0 was really a bunch of geeky early adopters trying to out-geek each other. Tim Ferriss, he would plant things under his skin, he'd ingest things, he'd measure things, wrote a great book called Four Hour Body. Um, admittedly, I've been trying some of these things for years as well, and it turns out it works pretty darn well. It's, it's some pretty interesting stuff. However, if this doesn't go outside of Silicon Valley, it really doesn't help people, and that's kind of where we've been stuck today. We've also seen the rise of the Internet of Things, right? Which is really, let's try sticking sensors everywhere and connect all that shit to the cloud and see what happens, right? So you're going to see the nest of fill in the blank. Fridges, night lights, washing machines, dryers, beverage ma makers, hearing aids. Um, nobody really knows why, but in the meantime, connecting them to the cloud, adding more sensors, adds a whole lot of cool novelty factor and unlocks new functionality those devices didn't have before. So it's sort of a Cambrian Sea style explosion of every device in your life getting connected to the cloud and seeing what resulting applications will open up from that. Again, this is cool, but you know, uh, one question I like to think about is why. We thought a lot about the what. We're taking commodity sensors, taking Bluetooth modules, Wi-Fi, adding them to everything under the sun. We think about the when that's happening now and will happen for the foreseeable next few years. We think about the where, the early adopter places like the Bay Area, New York. Uh, we think about the how and the how much uh, money that all makes. But there is a deeper underlying question I'm thinking more about, which is why are we doing all this? What's the point of all this measurement? Why are we connecting everything in the cloud? And uh, for what purpose, right? Um, towards that, I've been thinking about kind of where we're headed with this. In the back, there's a block diagram here. Um, I'm a PhD dropout myself in control systems theory. And the big thing they teach you in control theory is that 
You cannot control that which you do not observe, meaning if you don't measure it, you cannot track it, you cannot change the out outcome or the behavior of it. So right now, where we've been in wearables, quantified self, it's all in this 1.0 phase of read or measure it. That's enabled by sticking all of these sensors, the off-the-shelf cheap components, pedometers, accelerometers, um, uh, temperature gauges, et cetera, so that you can measure things like steps. With optoelectric, we can get things like heart rate. Um, with electrical terminals, you can get GSR, galvanic skin response for perspiration, ambient temperature. Um, dry EEG sensors can get you brain waves. Um, up next, we're going to be able to sense blood pressure pretty well, as well as take bl uh, biomarkers from dry blood uh, samples. Right? So with that, we're able to read things like now activity, exercise. Um, with GSR and other areas, we're getting pretty good reads on things like stress levels, sleep quality, and even now emotion and focus through brain waves and other sensors. So that's wave 1.0. What's coming up next though, now that we have this flood of data coming in, we need to interpret and comprehend, analyze, what is all this data? You've got 24 hour continuous streams, multi-sensor, multivariate feeds coming in. Right now, the companies feed that back as a dashboard to users, but the truth is users don't care about data. It doesn't mean anything until you can produce some green lights, yellow lights, red lights from it. That's the state of the industry today. We're scrambling to figure out what does that Fitbit dashboard really provide? What is all that stuff coming back uh, going to provide in terms of actionable insights? If we can figure all that out, where we're coming up to in the next few years is the notion of the feedback loop and writing, not just reading, but the ability to control, alter, augment, charge, use actuators to provide biofeedback, et cetera. This part gets really interesting. So instead of just uh, something that you'd wear on your head to read brainwaves for focus, like Interaxon or devices from Sense Labs, imagine being able to charge. So this is where early stage startups like Halo Neuro or Think are doing two-way, reading but also writing. Um, you know, at a simple level, you could think of it as the ab blaster for your brain. Who wants to try that, right? Uh, it turns out a lot of people. So there is a whole brain hacking culture already coming up. And what's interesting to me, these are not the realm of FDA. We run screaming from companies that need FDA because we think it's a horribly broken process. More interesting is the consumer-facing blossoming of all these devices, and you avoid the FDA slippery slope by having these be consumer, out-of-pocket paid-for devices that are more around augmenting or becoming superhuman or becoming uh, you know, wellness solutions as opposed to reparative, therapeutic, diagnostic, uh, or those sorts of things that would have a doctor or a payer involved. Uh, what I also like about this is in the realm of the hacker ecosystem, you provide APIs and let thousands of people come up with the use cases that you never would have predicted before. And that's kind of what we're seeing with the maker movement and the biohackers today. So what are we going to read, comprehend, and then write? Well, the era of the 80s and 90s were about bringing physical fitness to the masses. Now everybody knows physical fitness is really important. Starting in the 2000s, we now have the notion of mental fitness. Companies like Lumosity and others are proving that uh, keeping your brain fit, limber, keeping neuroplasticity is very important for the notion of mental fitness. I think starting now, we're starting to see grassroots movement of the next category, which I kind of think of as emotional fitness, if you will. And uh, you've probably seen it in the rise of things like mindfulness, meditation, positive psychology, work-life balance, all these kinds of things which, you know, admittedly decades ago were kind of in the land of, you know, granola hippies or maybe pseudo-religious spiritual overtones, but now are becoming very mainstream. When companies like Google are starting to institute chief mindfulness officers or having um, mindfulness practices at the beginning of meetings, or when public schools are starting off recess periods with mindfulness practices for the kids, you know that something is afoot. And what is really interesting to me is that um, this represents a giant market. Do you remember when, well, remember when there were big bookstores like Borders and you'd walk through and how many shelves could you count were under the self-help section? Endless ones, right? Fix your finances, fix your work-life balance, fix your stress level, fix all these things. Humans by nature were tuned to want to improve fix ourselves, uh, evolve, and that whole market is really up for grabs here, and that's kind of what I think we're going to be sort of reading, understanding, and then writing, changing behaviors around these dimensions. That's where all these startups are popping up in this area. The first wave you've seen is in the wearables on the body, so that's been tracking steps, activities, calories out. The next holy grail that everyone's going for in the next uh, couple of years is tracking calories in. 
That part is much harder. Calories out, we're pretty good at with heart rate, activity, et cetera. Calories in, nobody's quite figured it out yet, but that's exactly where we're going towards next. Um, on the mind side, you're starting to see startups, like I said, getting successful crowdfunding campaigns, pre-orders like Interaxon and others for being able to read signals from the brain which tell you your relative focus levels, ability to focus, concentrate, um, mindfulness, relaxation, all those sorts of things, and take you through these personalized courses on, on training and optimizing those areas. Um, in the next area, I think on the emotional wellness side, uh, I just led a Series A in a company called Thrive On, which is basically like therapy and emotional health coaching via mobile apps from actual certified human coaches. So we're going to be able to deliver these things at a distance remotely and in a very private, personalized, and secure way to consumers. Right? So these are some pretty interesting areas. So some of the key trends I want to walk you through quickly. Um, why this is all accelerating now, the technology, the sensors, the mobile apps, they add the immediate gratification, the feedback loop, the data to these sort of ancient practices or wisdoms. In the past, you, you could be doing meditation practice for, for decades and not really know if you're doing it right or, or anything else. But when you actually have a sensor and, and a, a pulse monitor on you, you can literally see the effects of your alpha waves coming in tune as you practice the, the box breath or things like that. And it provides a lot of validity to what, like I said, was normally in the realm of the spiritual or you know, kind of the religious. There's also a broader acceptance of this type of practice and mindfulness meditation. These are huge waves and, well, this is a bit of an out there statement, but I kind of think these practices are replacing what the, the church used to provide. People are seeking spiritual balance all the time, but with church attendance rates down, they're almost open towards more technologically oriented solutions now. Quantified self beyond the steps and activities. Like I said, we're gonna next be tracking calories in we're already starting to track sleep pretty accurately now with optoelectric sensors coming on things like the Samsung Gear, um, the Apple iWatch, Basis, all these other devices track very accurately the sleep state. And with galvanic skin response sensors that are coming out, stress levels are going to be pretty accurately measured. And this all gets towards basically mood tracking, mood optimization, and even mood training. So as you see quantified self applied everywhere, it won't just be in your health. It'll be applied, these principles uh, will be applied for things like work, quantified work. How productive are you? Are you focused? Are you distracted? When should you take a break? When should you get up? When should you talk to somebody else? Uh, the notion of quantified play, even quantified creativity. And that's what I mean by this quantified life. All aspects can benefit from the same principles of this read, analyze, write. Um, the body hacking trend will continue. Next up, it, we've already started tracking the body on activity. We've already started tracking the heart, the brain. And then we're going to be seeing the hacking of memories, emotion, and even our biology itself. There's some fascinating early stage companies in this area. And um, I'll give you a quick example. In the notion of memory hacking, neuroscience shows that uh, human memories do not behave like bits of data on a hard drive. Every time you encode or re, uh, retrieve that memory, you change it. So it's kind of like a game of telephone in your own mind. And they're heavily influenced by the emotions with which you experience that memory. This is why post-traumatic stress disorder is so powerful and so hard to decode, because that memory is burned in there with extremely negative emotions. Now there is research and applications of things like Oculus Rift virtual reality showing that you can relive that memory. You can even re-engineer the emotional mood, even through chemical stimulants like MDMA, re-encode that memory and remove the negative emotional bias around it and get it closer to neutral state. These will be some of the more interesting applications of things like Oculus and others. And that's uh, where we start to get into memory hacking. We're also going to get into what I call the prosthetics of the brain and the mind and memory. We're already outsourcing our photographic memory to Instagram. We're outsourcing a lot of other memories in our life to Facebook and whatnot. Already the cloud is becoming a prosthetic for your life. There are companies like Narrative where you wear a pendant-like camera and it snaps pictures constantly around the clock and the cloud figures out which ones are more interesting to you. That's the beginning of life logging. This fascinates me because well, I'm a new father and I'm thinking sort of, you know, someday my daughter will have direct access to my everyday life, all the moments. So it's not just, let me tell you what it was like. I had to walk 10 miles up and down. She'll see that minute by minute, right? It'll all be stored there because the cost of storage is so low. Logging your life in actuality will be feasible. Um, 
I think that we're going to see the rise of some pretty interesting things here. Some uh, new business models are going to pop up around these wearables. A lot of people ask me, how do you make money on this stuff? You sell these little gadgets, and the problem is a lot of people stop wearing the gadget after three weeks, and they just collect dust in your closet. What we're seeing now is this notion of hybrid services. So one of the best business models for wearables is to not just sell the gadget, but to have it come with a personalized subscription service that gives you personalized insights and data telling you what you should do, what you could do better, having you set your own goals of the you that you want to be, and providing coaching on how to get there. The most innovative part is, while we've used artificial intelligence, machine learning, and technology to provide that coaching, Imagine more of a TaskRabbit style network or a Zirtual style network where human beings, certified coaches, they could be doctors, nutritionists, etc., look at your data, provide real-time feedback, and give you those daily motivations and habits to work on. So that's where we see the future of these business models is device as a service. The service is powered by both technology and human-powered networks, sharing economy style. These wearable devices, like I said, they're going from read to read and write where they can give you biofeedback. And then the power of the cloud, building these prosthetics for your brain, for your mind, for your soul. Um, how many of you have seen the movie Her? Pretty amazing movie. I, I thought it was fascinating. Um, what was interesting about it, beyond Scarlett Johansson's voice, was the uh, notion of machine empathy. I think there's going to be a multi-billion dollar company, the equivalent of nuance, created around machine empathy. And what I mean by that, isn't it odd that Google Alerts or, or all apps talk to you in the same tone of voice? Pretty cold, pretty static. You know, as Google Alerts might say, you're running 30 minutes behind. And if you see that, you're going to say, no oh, shit, Sherlock, and you're stressed out. Um, do you remember Microsoft Clippy, that little uh, paper clip thing in, in the corner? Remember how outraged you get with that thing? And it turns out the reason why is that's an example of cognitive and emotional dissonance. Nothing pisses off human beings more than if you're getting upset and the other party is not mirroring or understanding that, and they're incessantly cheerful. It's the same with customer service reps, what they have to deal with. Machine empathy will understand our moods, our emotions through this tracking data and be able to tailor interfaces, alerts, messages, etc., based on those states. And uh, already we're seeing startups working in that area. So really, the power of the crowd then, when all our stories, all our experiences are connected together, which you kind of are living on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter already, I think we're kind of evolving our humanity towards really a bit of this networked human consciousness. Sounds a bit out there, but perhaps our fate is really to transcend our physical biology and kind of become more of this networked consciousness, right? Enabled by the cloud, measured by sensors, all these sorts of things. So back to the question of why. Um, this is the last slide and last point here, a little bit out there. Um, have any of you ever heard of that old uh, metaphor of if a million monkeys sat at a million typewriters and typed for a million years, they would come up with all the works of Shakespeare, right? That's just probability. Um, it turns out they would not just come up with the works of Shakespeare, they'd come up with every possible story, period. Very similar to uh, Borges' story, The Library of Babel, where um, you could basically construct every possible sentence uh, out of every letter, starting from A-A-A-A-A, A-A-A-A-B, A-A-A-C, going on down the road, right? So, my view is that all of our lives is basically the equivalent of a monkey at a typewriter. We are trying to figure out our story. We're trying our best to figure it out and capture it and share it. What all these technologies enable us to do is make sure that those stories are no longer wasted or go unused uh, or unshared. Uh, before, I think the sum of your life would be a two-sentence obituary. You born, were born this year, you died this year, had a couple kids, you did this, period. But there's so much more nuance in that experience. And the whole purpose of everything that we try to do is basically to express and capture, this is what it feels like to be me. This is my life experience. And to be able to figure that out, capture it, share it with others, and connect it is, I think, really the end goal. And that really fascinates me. I think the point of all this technology is not to be more robotic or cybernetic. It's actually make us more human. And the end goal is perfect empathy. I don't want to know what it's like to be you. I want to know what it, what it is to be you through all those experiences with memories. Chances are I relate in some way. And that's what all the, I think these technologies are for. Um, when we're talking about the human story, that's actually invaluable from a monetization standpoint. How much would you pay to capture that in perpetuity for all of your you know, uh, descendants to be able to study down the road? So. Uh, with that, I'm going to open it up for questions. I know it's a little bit out there, but uh, hopefully 
that will give you a bit of a framework of where a lot of these things are heading towards. So one question, right? One question over there? Yeah, absolutely. So the question around the fears of artificial intelligence and, and uh, privacy and all these things, and absolutely. We're going to see problems because your data is hosted by somebody. It probably starts with the letter G or F, or, and they're going to be analyzing it and sending you ads. But more importantly, a lot of these technologies, the access to them are not uniform. My biggest fear is actually, yes, there's privacy, but it's actually creating uh, the next more deeper level of the digital divide because these sorts of things always come to the wealthy, they always come to the early adopters, they always come to those with disposable income first. Um, if you have access to a cloud brain or you know, a creative offload processing or all these other services, you fundamentally have an advantage that someone who's not connected does, you know, doesn't get. So that's gonna exacerbate this notion of digital divide even more. Uh, eventually, probably within 20, 24, 25 years, we'll see the notion of kind of like who has access to post-human, you know, kind of uh, functionality versus sort of basic human 1.0 functionality. Yeah. yeah. The big, big bucks are gonna come from enterprise because they can write the giant check sizes for the RFPs on projects, vertical business intelligence applications, et cetera, leveraging Watson. Um, those will be great B2B businesses. For the newer applications, we tend to be fans of startups that are doing the let a thousand flowers bloom approach by opening up you know, basically sub hundred dollar hardware kits to hackers and makers and letting them come up with the applications. Again, skirting the FDA, skirting all these other things because they are direct to consumer and they're coming up with the applications. Um, great example, um, I'm an investor in a company called 3D Robotics, one of the leading multi-copter drone companies. That thing was crowdsourced. It was a DIY community, literally called DIY Drones, and they had no clue what it'd be used for. And instead, the thousands of hackers would come up with applications like, oh, cinematographer in the sky, or you know, farm mapping, or those sorts of things. So on the consumer side, it's really hard for startups to even know. Instead, the best playbook is open up your API, give out the SDKs, let the hackers and makers figure out the consumer applications, jump on the emergent ones, productize it, and then um, another wave of entrepreneurs will study that and say, wait a minute, I see a business enterprise opportunity, then go build that same equivalent on a B2B basis, right? But then be doing it as a SaaS business or, you know, kind of a consulting business and making the big business RFPs off that. All right. Thank you, guys. Great. Thank you so much, Tim. That was awesome.